too much work. Um, so let's talk before you go down that path. Um, yeah, yeah. Hello? Is it on? I had a camera, so. Mine's on. It's fine. No, why don't you Hello? That sounds right, yeah. <laughs> we have a hard deadline of 2.30, right? Like, is that true? We do not have a hard deadline. I don't know. Did somebody tell you that? Well, the visiting committee is here. Oh. I got you with Alyssa. <laughs> okay, well, in that case, okay. okay. It's 3.30, but they have the director's office on the time occasion. Oh, it's like a spurs. Okay. <laughs> Oscar, listen, we have a hard deadline. What we we have a hard deadline of two thirty. I know. It's okay, is that right? Okay. Well, no. I mean, we're supposed to go to the visit. Okay. They, oh, you have it, but the room is reserved here until three thirty. Yeah, but just yeah, it's a scheduling problem. So they bullied their way into it. Is that? Yes. Right? They they moved the visiting committee meeting so that they could do this. Yes. And the visiting committee should be here, but they're too busy being the visiting. Committee. Oh. So you you get to sit down. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> So should I start, Nelson? No. Okay. And this is on now? This, this supposedly is. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk slowly, but not for too long, so that everybody gets to hear everything that Ashley has to say, because what I have to say is only important in that it's about Ashley. Um, and so uh, I think I know everybody, but I'm Melissa Goodman, and uh, I have the honor of introducing my colleague, um, mm -hmm. Ashley Villar, who many of you may mistakenly think is still a graduate student here. That is not correct. Uh, she is an assistant professor here, and she uh, left us in um, 2020 and was an in-person person at the Simons Foundation. Yes. Yeah, because the Simons Foundation had a very enlightened mask policy. Um, and then she went to Penn State to be a professor there for a couple of years, and then she came back last year, in case you didn't notice. Um, but before that, she got her undergraduate degree at MIT um, in 2014, which I just have to tell you, Ashley, makes it exactly 30 years after my PhD at MIT and my, uh, sorry, my undergraduate degree at MIT and my PhD at Harvard. So I feel like Ashley is like the new improved uh, faculty <laughs> member here at Harvard. And, and I say that not just because it's not about me, but it's about the way um, that she approaches astronomy. So many of you probably know that Ashley is very well known for her data, science, statistics, uh, AI approaches to any kind of data that has anything to do with things that change over time, most notably things that explode and make all kinds of exciting astrophysical objects for us to all observe. Um, but today, she's going to tell us everything about data-driven methods to understand the dynamic universe. And I just want to say thank you. And I think that what Ashley is doing is the future of astronomy. And so I'm very eager to hear her talk. So go ahead, Ashley. Thank you. OK, thanks. Oh, it's so loud. Um, thank you. Also, that was an extremely kind introduction. And it's genuinely always uh, such a pleasure and honor to talk in front of this audience. Ooh, they turned me down. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I arrived here just a few months, about half a year ago at this point, maybe nine months ago. Um, and I've given a talk very recently where I focused very much on the key science goals of our group, which is understanding explosions of stars. Um, but we do a lot more than that in the group. We really think a lot about connecting machine learning and data-driven science to a huge variety of time variable phenomena. So today is kind of a weird talk, and I really want it to be informal in the sense of, I hope the AV team isn't too annoyed, but if you have questions throughout, please just ask, and I can repeat the question for Zoom. Um, 
And what I would like you to take away is hopefully some inspiration about how you can use these new methods in research, how we're combining these methods with our own domain knowledge to make important discoveries in science, and just an invitation to come chat with me. I will be here for at least a few more years. So, <laughs> um, so I always start with this kind of comically low resolution GIF of the night sky uh, to tell you that my group studies the dynamic universe or time domain astrophysics. By that, I really do mean things that are evolving in our night sky on human time scales, so from hours to days to months. But really today, as I said before, the talk is more about the marriage of understanding these time variable phenomena with data-driven methodologies. We're going to cover way too much science. Um, in a way, but that's, that's a feature of this talk. I want to show that by pairing these science-driven questions for a wide variety of time domain phenomena and understanding the domain um, aspects, that is the astrophysics behind the problem, we can actually individualize, customize, and build machine learning strategies to answer a really wide variety of interesting questions. So 100%, we're going to jump around to many scientific vignettes. At any point, please feel free to stop me. But I really want to emphasize is, what is the key science problem? Why were we unable to solve this tr with traditional methods? And what have we developed to get around this? I'm really lucky that um, I get to have a great group of people that help me explore this really wide variety of science using a combination of traditional um, observational studies, developing new analytical models to understand these phenomenon, and of course, developing new statistical and machine learning driven methods. And uh, all of the work basically I talk about today is very much driven by junior scientists, and I will highlight them as much as I can. So I told you what time domain is. Enough. I told you that's time variable phenomena. You know that's at least exploding stars. You saw a few cartoons. But what's machine learning? It's mainly popular. Um, it's something that's very common in use right now. And I think importantly, I hope we agree, there, there really is a shift in the way that we're living and the way we're integrating AI in our lives, but also the way we're integrating it in our science. I wanted to contrast this with the rise of statistics in our field. I think most of us wouldn't put the word statistics in an, like, I completed the study using statistics in a title or abstract. That's obvious. That's an obvious tool that we all have in our tool set. Here I chose the word Bayesian, just a subtype or philosophy behind physics, or sorry, behind statistics that's now quite popular. And I did so because statistics follows a very similar trend, but is 10,000 times higher, so I didn't want to use that. Contrast that growth, which has been pretty steady in the last decade, with the rise of neural networks which is just rapidly accelerating uh, to the point where it's now as popular in abstracts as Bayesian statistics. It really is something that's being integrated into almost every subfield of astrophysics, and I assume soon every subfield. I just looked last night. There were about 50 page papers on Astrophysics Archive. Five of them contained machine learning. Okay, so it's popular. But what is it really? Um, this is a pretty generic definition. But machine learning is just a new set of techniques that allows us to understand a structure in data and use that structure to make predictions about new data we haven't seen yet. It helps us map from one set of variables to another. I've cut out my five minute introduction to a neural net for this talk, but please just come talk to me if you want me to give it to you. Um, I promise I've taught many high schoolers how to build a neural net. They're not very difficult. But really the key takeaway is that at some level at least, they are really good approximators to any nonlinear function. You can almost in specific circumstances, think of it like a very clever piecewise function. Okay, that, that sounds maybe useful. I don't know. Um, in prep for this talk, I watched a colloquium by David Hogg, who is both comically like a proponent and absolute hater of machine learning. Um, and he brought up this fun introduction of the question, what major discoveries in astrophysics have been enabled by machine learning? 
and then the slides blank. And he, the claim is that's true. It's, it's nothing. And I don't, I don't know if that's wrong. Um, of course, <laughs> it's not wrong. Like, we can't quite point to some discovery that's truly just enabled by machine learning. But I don't think that's very fair. At some level, you can't subscribe any discovery to just statistics. It's to understanding the physical knowledge and applying a tool to the problem. So in that sense, I see machine learning as incredibly useful and very much a backbone of many scientific discoveries, including those in astronomy. It's just that it's more of an engineering technique. It's a way that we can solve these problems instead. So with that framework in mind, yeah, I think it is useful. It's only useful, though, in the context that we understand exactly what scientific problem that we are trying to solve, and we match the method correctly to that problem. So that's, that's the frame of reference we're going to have for the rest of this talk as I show you a few examples of how we've done that. In my field of time domain astrophysics, um, machine learning as an engineering or a tool set has been fundamental in understanding large survey data. And it's kind of obvious. There's a ton of data. We right now get as much of a terabyte per night from surveys like the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is a, um, it's called a wide field untargeted survey, meaning I have a fairly wide field of view. I look through, I scan through the sky, not targeting any particular galaxies, but just returning to the same patches to find new flashes of light. There's many surveys that do this. PanSTARS, medium deep field, was one of the um, classic, uh, I would say, forefathers of what will become LSST. And then one that I'm involved in, I'll talk about very briefly, the Young Supernova Experiment, or Yeezy, that uses PanSTARS data. Um, of course, though, I think what's exciting is that on the horizon, in theory, in 2025, I wouldn't quote this, but this is officially true. Um, in 2025, there will be a new survey coming online that I hope we've all heard about, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, conducted by the Verici Rubin Observatory, that will take uh, unparalleled video of the Southern Hemisphere, unprecedented depth, uh, with a wide array of filters. It's going to be a discovery machine for time domain astrophysics. And I've shown a plot like this, I think, a million times. Um, here I'm showing you the discovery rate of supernovae as a function of year. There's a few things to note. One is just that our discovery rate has been growing exponentially. We discover about 10,000 or so supernovae now. But really, to highlight, that gray line is what fraction gets a spectroscopic classification. Everything else that doesn't get a spectroscopic classification, we basically ignore and we don't use for our science. Which means that in practice, we throw away about 90%. And we, we just kind of accept that as a field. When Vera Rubin turns on, um, that discovery rate, again, just thanks to its um, wide field of view, its uh, limiting magnitude, it'll discover about a million supernovae every year. And we're not going to drastically increase our spectroscopic resources, so it ends up being about 99% of all of our science will be thrown away. So that's bad. Um, and this leads us to our first classic engineering problem. If we want to do science, and we're looking at a zoo of possible phenomenon, I just need to figure out first and foremost, well, what physical model do I need to apply to this data? Was this a red supergiant that exploded? Was it a white dwarf that exploded? Was it a gamma ray burst? I need to classify it into um, different categories. So what makes that challenging? I'm going to tell you just two problems that we've identified and solved. Uh, one is that the light curves that we see, which are the light as a function of time and filter, tend to be sparse and noisy and honestly just hard to navigate. It's hard to extract a feature from this and say, ah, yeah, I know that this lasts for roughly 30 days and therefore it's a type 1a supernova. The other challenge is a combination of historic and physical. We have this hierarchy of our taxonomies of classes. It's historic in the sense of when the first Lizwicky went and looked at spectroscopy, they would say, oh, I think I see hydrogen here, so I'll call that type 2. And if I don't see hydrogen, I'll call it a type 1 explosion. 
the truth is that there is astrophysics behind those statements, whether or not I have a hydrogen envelope. And there really is this kind of wide zoo of the many ways that massive stars can die. They naturally do sort into these broad categories of I've lost all my hydrogen and maybe I'm um, very massive, was rapidly spinning, maybe I wasn't. Well, maybe I wasn't going this way. And so there's this hierarchical taxonomy. We solved the first issue by actually just going to basics and saying, you know, as physicists, we're quite good at fitting models. In this case, there isn't one physical model to rule them all. And so we're going to just build an empirical par parameterized uh, model that we think loosely captures how we think a supernova explodes. That is, it rises. Maybe if there's hydrogen, there's some recombination, it plateaus, and otherwise it falls off. OK. That model fits the observed data quite well. And so what we can do is just take this model and fit it to everything we see, and then learn how to combine the parameters of the model cleverly to predict the probability that I'm from a white dwarf or a red supergiant. Um, this is kind of old news in the sense of this field has been doing that for a while now, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, in our latest development, I really want to highlight work from now graduate student here, Kaylee DeSoto, who has used this type of methodology along with a random forest, which we won't talk about, to have um, an incredibly excellent classification of supernovae using that hierarchical taxonomy, um, well, I should be clear, using the, the leaf nodes, so the very end of that taxonomy, the different types of supernovae, um, instead of spectroscopy, using photometry but does an excellent job recovering those classifications. What's novel is that uh, we don't have to use redshift information to do this, and yet we still perform quite well. But actually, more than that, um, we have outperformed every other classifier in the literature, which I've been very excited about. Um, not just that, it's one of the only ones that's running live, meaning that you can go on this website called Antares. Don't do that right now, but you could. Um, and you can see that it's already classified about 1,500 supernovae in real time. And it runs fast enough, even though we're using like traditional fitting methods, to run on every single supernova light curve and then some in the air of LSST. So that's great. In this case, um, we've done pretty simplistic methods, but relying on our physical intuition of just fitting models to understand, to get good results, and to honestly quantify our uncertainties quite well, to get uncertainties on probabilities, and to do it really fast. We haven't incorporated, um, in that method, that graph structure. But actually, it's something that we just recently solved. And to do that, we said, well, traditional machine learning methods typically just ask the question, this is really simplifying, but ask the question, can you make sure you guess the right thing? And I'll give you a cookie every time you get the right answer. So I just try to increase, not quite accuracy, but something close. But we have this taxonomy in which I actually have some wrong answers that are better than the others. If I say um, that a type 1C, and these, these names don't matter, I misclassify a type 1B as a 1C or 1C as a 1B, that's much better for us, as in that's much closer physics than something like a type 2, which looks totally different. And so what we did recently is to actually just write down this as a graph, a conditional probability built on this graph structure, and then optimize, or what I want to say is reward a cookie in kind of partial fractions. I'll give you most of the cookie if you tell me it's at least not containing um, hydrogen and helium. And I'll give you all of the cookie if you get the exact subclass right. And what's exciting about this is now, um, we also are clever about weighting, no matter how rare or how deep I go, I can include you in the final classification. Great. Classification, I want people to not zone out and think, OK, whatever. They're classifying supernovae, but that has nothing to do with my science, because that's not quite the problem we have. That's not true. You can also use this type of thinking to search for physics that's otherwise difficult to find. 
I'm going to tell you this small story about um, a recent supernova that happened very nearby in the Pinwheel Galaxy um, that was an explosion of a red supergiant that uh, was, there was a lot of fuss. Daichi gave a great talk at ITC about this. Um, and importantly, what was so exciting is that because it was so nearby, because it was discovered so soon, we were able to follow up observationally very quickly, and we were able to see exactly what the structure of material looked like just around, but not within, the star itself. And we think the explosion of red supergiants is, like, known. It just, it's the most common type of core collapse supernova. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't be too hard. It's mainly powered by recombination. It goes up, plateaus, go down. What we found instead was really surprising. Well, there were some hints in the literature, but it was still surprising. Um, one, is that when you go back in time, before the supernova went off, you can actually look at the progenitor system and see, so actually look at the red supergiant before it exploded, and see that in the infrared, it had these incredibly large variations in the infrared, these pulsations um, that are shown here in pink and green, that were unexpected. And then the other thing that we saw was that if you look at the early part of the light curve, it wasn't just an explosion. It wasn't just radioactive material powering this. There was a shock of energy injection, suggesting that there was material surrounding the star when it exploded. In fact, it was a lot of material, um, up to a solar mass of material across 10 years prior to its explosion. Yikes. So that's not something that we expect naturally from stellar evolution. It's much more than a a kind of line-driven wind. Um, but what we wanted to ask instead is, OK, with Yeezy, PanStars data, we actually have access to 10 years of prior information of looking at that point in the sky. If this red supergiant lost that mass, a solar mass, up to, I'm going to be clear, up to a solar mass, of material, shouldn't I have seen that as some sort of eruption, kind of like an LBV? It's hard to answer that question with a model because we would have to kind of generate the model every point in time across all model space. And so it's it just complicated to figure out how to do that. Instead, what we did is we just trained a simple neural net to look at our data, well, to look at limits from our data, and we showed it examples where we had artificially put in a, a pre-explosion eruption and then examples when we didn't have it. And we trained a classifier, just like I've talked about before, to answer that question. Do you or do you not see a supernova pre-eruption? Um, I want to make sure, actually, that I highlight that this analysis was all done by postdoc, Connor Ransom, and then um, incoming grad student, Anna Tartaglia, developed that physical model. What we found is that is kind of contradictory. There's no evidence for such an eruption, down to an extremely limiting magnitude, about minus seven, so that's like right in the middle of red supergiants. We really don't see any flares, to the point where we're limiting it to about 0.1, a little bit more than 0.1 solar masses. There's a contradiction here we haven't quite figured out. Probably there's some dust, maybe it was continuous mass loss, we don't know. But importantly, with our methodology of this classifier, we are able to get such a deep limit because our neural network understood the concept, in a sense, of not just individual limits, but limits taken together, limits across wavelength. It really understood those correlations in the model, allowing us to probe to the deepest limit in the literature, and really ruling out a lot of the predictions from the supernova itself. So we've used this for classification and for identification of new physics. Um, but we've also used machine learning recently to help us extract physics from data which would have otherwise been infeasible. I'm going to take you on a really different journey now. Um, I think we all know about binary neutron stars. Hopefully we do. So these things end up uh, losing energy due to gravitational waves, merging, 
And then the isotropic electromagnetic counterpart that we briefly see is called the kilonova and is primarily powered by the radioactive decay of very heavy elements like lanthanides and actinides. We think, for now, that this seems to be the vast majority, almost maybe the only primary location of this heavy element nucleosynthesis in our universe. There's been one event that has been jointly observed in gravitational waves and electromagnetic uh, signatures that hasn't changed since 2017, which is honestly too bad. Um, but I actually want to give you an update to the story that has played out thanks to machine learning. And first I have to tell you that when we told you this first story, we kind of lied to you. Um, or really, I'll show you under the hood. To get this result, which is showing you uh, a collection of obser observations taken around the globe, and then a simple analytical model being shown in lines that looks like quite a good fit, uh, that analytical model was very simplistic to the point where we really just kind of Lego brick together different components of radioactive decay. We said some component had uh, almost no lanthanides, so it looked blue. Some component had many lanthanides, it looked red. And we'll just add them together. That's fine. But since then, there's actually been a lot of discussion about um, these components and interpreting them physically. In particular, this early blue emission, which we made a statement was due to lanthanide-free radioactive decay, may in fact be, maybe due, I don't believe this, it might be due to cocoon emission, that's probably not true, it might be due to accretion onto the neutron star, um, we might just be fundamentally wrong about how some of the, the light R process elements actually decay. We don't really know. And the way to solve this truly is to inject some of these blue emission sources into a, sim a full radiative transfer simulation and watch as those photons get reprocessed. That's the only way to really rule out if there's this multi-component um, this multi-component signature to what we are observing. That's hard to do. It's hard to do uh, because our full radiative transfer simulations end up being very expensive. I can only make a few of them, and I can only select them across actually a pretty big grid of physical parameters. I can only select a few masses, a few energies, a few composition, lanthanide fraction, opacities, whatever I want to choose against. Um, the higher dimensional this is, obviously, like 3D, here we're using 2D sims, costs hundreds of CPU hours to run for just one model. And so I can't easily produce something where I've densely sampled all parameter space. I also can't really naively interpolate across this system, across this parameter grid. Why? Because the output of these simulations is a very high density um, spectral energy distribution across time. I'm watching every photon at every wavelength. I care about these individual atomic signatures. I care about the overall bulk component of that spectroscopy. It's not as easy as me doing np.interp. So instead, once again, we have to turn to neural network or some form of nonlinear emulation. Um, so this was a really cool project led by uh, Marco Ristic, who's on the job market um, at RIT, where we, thanks to a wonderful, it's actually a Gaussian process-based emulator, doesn't matter, but thanks to an emulator that actually does non-linearly account for how to interpolate, we were able to show that um, one, we could, well, actually what I want to say is that when we do add a blue kind of component, and here we're just assuming some thermal component, light and lanthanide, so radioactively powered, it has the opposite effect that we thought it would happen in the toy model. Those blue photons, so that's being shown in this um, blue spectrum, the three component model, end up getting, by the time they get to the surface, reprocessed into the red. And so we actually end up having even a larger uh, discrepancy between the data and our models themselves. So it's possible that it wasn't a radioactive component. It's, we're still not sure, again, 
But thanks to this neural network emulator, we were allowed to play with this grid of models and actually understand the nonlinear effects that these components have with one another. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna tell you now, yet another science, I might actually pause to see if there are questions now that we've done like three science vignettes. Yeah. Yeah. So it says ML enabled emulation, but I'm curious what can tell what us we did. more about what the details of that emulation was. Yeah, and I definitely swept it under the rug. Um, so we did two projects on this. This one, we did um, a Gaussian process, and this is why <laughs> it's complicated. We did a Gaussian process emulator. What does that mean? It's kind of confusing. Um, we look at those time series of time evolving spectral energy distributions. We reduce them down with PCA basically. And we say like, okay, there's like a few components we can build up to do that. And then we actually say, I'm going to interpolate across those components, which is kind of weird. Um, but I'm gonna do so without doing like linear or polynomial. I'm gonna do a Gaussian process, which just says, I'm gonna figure out how much these things should correlate to each other. I'm not gonna impose some structure. I'm just gonna learn about that covariance. And then I'm able to sample across that grid and have a very good sense of the uncertainty as I do it. Um, I don't know if that's sufficient detail. And then I'll just, just in passing note that in a follow-up work, we did this again with a, a pure neural net strategy, um, but for light curves instead. So there's lots of ways you can go about doing this. If not, I'm happy to continue. Okay, let us continue. So, um, I'll tell you about a second, um, well, okay, this is like an end at this point. I'll tell you about yet another project in which we're under, interested in inference, extracting physical features from a light curve, again, in a really different context. Here, we're now looking at supermassive black holes, especially those that are actively accreting baryonic matter, so gas in their disk. Those are called, as we know, active galactic nuclei. Um, I will say this is not my main science interest. This was something that we explored uh, quite a few years ago that um, I kind of just fell in love with the statistics of these events. Importantly, so let me tell you about statistics. Um, what I like about them is that these are a process in which that supermassive black hole is accreting on some physical matter, but we actually don't have a great forward models. We don't have a great simulation of how this happens, despite having ten, hundreds of thousands of AGN um, observable to us. Instead, the best model in the literature has been the so-called damped random walk, which what you should take away from that is kind of a random process that we attempt to fit to the light curve that we see. We can't extract any physics from that, even though one would assume that the black hole, the accretion rate of that supermassive black hole has to imprint somehow on that light curve. We don't get that from the damped random walk. Um, not only that, the um, damped random walk is wonderful for these types of time series. So here I'm showing you, I think this is either a Kepler or a test light curve. Um, Importantly, that's in one filter, and it's very densely sampled in time. But with LSST, we're gonna have multi-band uh, filters that will be sparsely sampled in time. The multi-band statement makes this challenging in a way. Um, why is that? Because the photons coming from the active galactic nuclei disk depending on their color, actually arising from different components of that disk. The hotter photons are coming from the more centralized radii, and the cooler photons are coming from larger radii. Okay. Uh, and so, incorporating that multi-filter information can be quite challenging. What we do here is to, um, is to think about this as a continuous time process. What does that mean? 
I think that this is some sort of fluids dynamic situation. I think that there is a differential equation that is governing the physics driving this variability. And I want to be able to learn what that differential equation looks like. And I know that that can be a function of time and wavelength. So I want to incorporate that somehow. Um, here I'm showing you, for a damped random walk, not so important, but the fundamental parameter of the time scale of that variability, which, again, we think might be related to the mass of a supermassive black hole. What we do is to design, again, a specialized neural network that understands that the data we're looking at is a continuous process and that the thing we care about is twofold. I want to know the physical parameters driving that active galactic nuclei, and I want to be able to predict something about the light curve. I want to be able, so I'm cutting up my neural net so you can see how this works. Um, so basically, I, I literally just train a neural net uh, to update the derivative and the value of a differential equation over time, and I also ask it, um, can you kind of learn a representation of this light curve over time and update it as you see new data. This half of the neural net spits out the uh, expectation of what the light curve will do over time. Importantly, we want to know this information because we want to know when the AGN is doing something incredibly peculiar. A good example is changing look AGN, or a tidal disruption event, when some dense cloud of dust, or a star, approaches too closely and suddenly flares up. This is still possible with Gaussian processes, but again, challenging when you have multiple filters. But in our uh, neural net approach, we're able to have a pretty reasonable approximation of what we, it should be doing in time, and uncertainties that easily cover the variance that we see. But then we can pair this um, with the second half of that neural network that at the same time is making predictions for exactly the physical properties governing that light curve. How do we do that? Well, in this case, we had really good two-dimensional simulations of an AGN. Now, to be fair, it was driven by a damped random walk, but it contained all the physics of diffusing out that light across the disk. We then told the neural net, here is a light curve that we've simulated in LSST, and I've tagged it with the fundamental parameters. And so, as a secondary output, predict those fundamental parameters given that light curve. By doing both simultaneously, we're able to tell the full story consistently of those AGN. The idea is that now we can use these sorts of methodologies on um, much larger data sets where hopefully we can measure some properties independently of the AGN, but importantly, learn the structure of these light curves without relying on some somewhat arbitrary um, stochastic process like the damped random walk. This is gonna be extremely important in the era, once again, of LSST, where uh, we will discover somewhere between 10 and 100 million AGN across a 10-year baseline. These studies haven't been available before because we've lacked the sheer statistics, the multiband photometry, um, and the long baseline. And this is the unique combination that does really enable telling the full story of accretion physics, hopefully given these new uh, data-driven models. OK, I'm going to stop one more time to see if there are questions before going on to the last point. Well, yeah. Have you tried it? Are we making a ZTF data? Yeah. Oh, I see. So I can repeat, um, too. Yes, uh, but others online may not. I just wanted to know if you've tested this result, this methodology. Yeah. Because I look at that light curve, and is the orange your, your expectation? Yeah, that's right. Oranges are, go ahead. It, it looks smooth, less, am, lower amplitude than the actual data. Yeah, so the smooth median is quite, um, what do I want to say? It's flat. 
And so we have compared against, this is not very technical, we have compared against the full power spectrum, and there we know the truth because it's that damped random walk, and we do get back the same characteristic shape, despite the fact that the median implied is quite smooth. Um, we also do a better job at prediction than the Gaussian process regression, which is the state of the art in the field. Now, we haven't tested on ZTF data, um, and it's kind of annoying why. So ZTF data has correlated noise, uh, which is really annoying. So it's bad for us because this process has correlated signal, and so that looks just like noise in ZTF data. Um, so right now, it's not possible to do. I, I don't know why. This is not solvable, but we worked with the PI, the science, the project scientists of ZTF on this project. So that's definitely true. Um, LSSD should not have this problem because it should. It has a longer cadence between the two points, since that should reduce some correlated noise, and then also should just have a better reduction pipeline. Yeah. And is that the only data set that you found have correlated noise in this sense? I don't know how many of you looked at. Um, so the other one is CRTS, CTRS, I forget, but that's single band. And then the other one is actually what I showed you previously, so people also played this game. If someone's actually AGN, I feel, oh, I'm sorry, I can repeat, have you looked at other data sets? Um, the other data set you can use at very high cadence, but single band again, is Kepler and TESS, and that has uh, extremely well-known correlated noise that's caused by instrumental effects. So unfortunately, yeah, this has actually been an issue across the board, um, is detangling instrumental effects from this known correlated, well, what we assume will end up being a correlated process of the agent itself. Other questions? No? Oh, yeah, Josh. What if you're... <coughs> Variability is not what you were assuming initially, damp random walk, but there was a, mm -hmm. a correlated uh, yes. variability. In fact, this is something that you and I should talk about. We found this in the DASH data oh. for the very first quasar discovered that we all know is 3C273, and we found that it contains a very prominent, this is with a hundred years of optical data right across the hall, all digitized now, uh, of 16.9 years. And that agrees beautifully with the VLBI measurement back in 1999, ancient history, uh, that gave the same number. The difference is we're looking at the optical emission that we normally had thought is coming from an accretion disk, yeah. but it's not. It's coming from the jet, and the jet is processing at a 16.9 year period. There's some beautiful uh, confirmation of that, which was never related to what I just mentioned, either the VLBI result or the DASH result. And we had a preliminary paper on this a few years ago uh, that Anita here was the first author on, and several of us found and now I'm going to be doing a final all of the data uh, and it's it, it really agrees uh, not just in the period but with the structure that Chandra could see in the jet you could see what looks like a spring unwinding uh, and there's some beautiful images that I wasn't aware of until just recently yes. so depending on what you start out by assuming you may get a very different answer yeah, um, so that's a good question. Uh, and also very interesting, so I did not know this. Uh, I would believe that that's, if you have multiple lines of agreement, I would believe that that's astrophysical. In this case, so I should emphasize, um, part of what makes this exciting, yeah, we ended up using a damped random walk model, but that was just a choice for us to have something compared to. It actually is completely independent of that choice. We could have used any stochastic process, deterministic process, anything, to be driving this variability. And we showed just in the singular case, we were able to um, get back the power spectrum that we injected. So that's, that's kind of the strength of this. In the damped random walk model, you are assuming that. In our new method, you're not assuming anything about this process. You're using the data to build up knowledge and structure that it sees. Yeah. Oh. I think you go. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, this is a forced transition, the best I could do. So this is, I think, the last project that I'll actually talk about, which is, OK, so I said that um, we're going to discover many, many AGNs. So I, I think it's an exciting field, not my main science. Um, but we're going to also discover with LSST is about 10 billion galaxies that will have spectral energy distributions of. And I'm not, I'm not a galaxy scientist, so I don't really care. Uh, however, I do care about finding the most interesting supernovae within our cosmos. And it just turns out that supernovae understand where they live, where they come from. And so the weirdest supernovae tend to prefer the weirdest galaxies. But we want to make sure that when we look at those galaxies, that we understand why we've selected them as weird. I don't really care if it's weird because it's the closest galaxy, it's Andromeda. That's not interesting. I want to understand physically, is this low metallicity? Is it a high star formation rate? Is the mass quite low? That's the kind of cuts I want to make. And then there's this really amorphous concept of morphology. We know that morphologies can be elliptical, spiral, and just incredibly irregular. But we don't have a great statistic to cut on that kind of weirdness of a morphology. So that's when we turned once again to neural networks. And we had a very specific type of neural network structure. We showed this neural network many images of galaxies. And we asked that neural network to reproduce those images of galaxies for us in kind of this um, architectural setup. In the process of reading in images and spitting them back out, we forced the neural network to condense the image itself into a small vector. That vector needed to summarize all of the information within that galaxy, but just in a few numbers. But then we made a second point. We said, and also, in that small dimensional vector, can you make sure that the first dimension exactly corresponds to redshift? And can you make sure the second dimension exactly corresponds to star formation rate and the third to, um, to angle on the sky? So then by doing that, we kind of had one free dimension left. And we said, do whatever you want with that one. In practice, I think you only have morphology left. But whatever you want to encode there, go ahead and do it. Whatever helps you regenerate the image. And then as a very minor point, the last thing we do is make it continuous. Um, because it, it helps results. When we do that, so here, just ignore the red and green, just look at the blue. Um, we do a pretty good job of getting back with this neural net the predicted um, redshifts, mass, star formation, and again, I just said the angle. But importantly, we also made a, gener a model where we could really understand exactly what it was doing within that low dimensional space. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Um, what I could do is I could go to that kind of space and I can say, hey, here's a picture of a galaxy. I'm now going to change that one dimension that I said needs to exactly correspond to angle on the sky. And you can see, as I fix everything else and, and change this linearly, it does. It's able to rotate that galaxy. Similarly, if we only change redshift information at higher redshift, it seems to get dimmer and ever so slightly redder. So that seems reasonable. Star formation rate, I don't know. It's doing something a little funkier. Yeah, it's getting maybe a little bit bluer and maybe a little blobbier. Unclear. But I think what's really interesting is that this final dimension, the one that we let fix, but we, you know, we prescribe to morphology, indeed does seem to do something with maybe elasticity of the galaxy. We're not sure. But importantly, it's able to capture this information in a way that's incredibly interpretable for us so that we can ask questions like, uh, can you find for me something with a strange morphology, even if I can't normally quantize that, and a low star formation rate or a high star formation rate. As just one proof of concept for this paper, um, we did a nearest neighbor search where basically we just said, OK, I know of two kind of interesting types of galaxies that exist in this um, data set, green peas, which are these kind of low mass, high star formation rate um, objects, and then these red spirals that are 
Morphologically, spiral galaxies, but they seemingly have no ongo ongoing star formation. And by doing that, we can say, okay, in your small latent space, find me nearest neighbors to help me find new green peas and red spirals. And it does a good job of pointing out very similar looking anomalous galaxies. So our next step here is tagging this with supernova data and asking questions jointly about finding not just weird galaxies, but also weird light curves and finding, um, once I find one example of a weirdo, finding all of his friends. Okay, um, I wanna end very, very briefly by just discussing, um, honestly, it's just an invitation. This is what the group is working on now uh, in our ML side of things. Um, and that's in particular, I'm thinking of it as framing the future of survey science. I think a little bit about this is the paper of the future. And I think of this as what does the survey of the future look like? Um, and there's, there's two places where we've been thinking hard. There's one that is kind of this database of information. We're gonna have petabytes of information from LSST, 20 terabytes every night coming in. How do we sort through that in some intelligent way uh, that we can actually understand new structure within the data to understand new physics? There's been this really exciting revolution that like, I'm sure you're all familiar with of generative AI. You are most familiar with this probably through something like ChatGBT. Um, A, what do I want to call this? A synonym, I guess, of this is uh, this idea that I want to train an incredibly large neural network, we're going to call it a foundation model, with many types of data. I'm going to show it a picture of a dog, and I'm going to tell it in words, this is a picture of a yellow lab. It then connects those two concepts together and builds an incredibly informative mind map of the abstracted concept of a dog. There's a sense in which we have the same information in survey science, in multiple surveys combined together. There's a really great recent paper by Francois Lanous that showed um, a first effort towards this idea. That I can take many images of galaxies I can go to another survey and say, hey, you also happen to get a spectrum of this galaxy. What I'm gonna do is build up a mind map or a representation of these images, and I'm gonna tell you that this mind mapped point for this galaxy needs to correspond exactly to the mind map point for that spectrum of the same galaxy. I'm gonna tag those together, just like the picture of the dog and the words of the dog, so that when I now, in a future survey, am only given an image of a galaxy, way cheaper than a spectrum, I can automatically generate a pretty good guess of what that spectrum is. And more importantly, I can translate that into a first guess at its physical parameters, like its redshift and its mass. That's the concept behind these multimodal foundation models. And what they do is they enable a lot deeper understanding of your data set, and they help in a number of physical tasks. Um, so we have just been, so this is what we're working on now. Um, I just got through the Aramont uh, fellowship funding to build the first time domain foundation model where we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say, here's a spectrum of a supernova, here's a light curve of that supernova, and here's the image of the galaxy that that supernova is living in. And tied together, build up a bigger understanding of what does a white dwarf explosion actually look like? What does a red supergiant explosion actually look like? And help me find targets that look like each other, find the weirdos, classify the targets by using this really informed mind map. The other side of things is how humans are interacting with this mind map. When like SDSS is slightly before my time, but SDSS came around, I think everyone I assume learned like SQL and SQL to talk about these things, or maybe half did, um, which is kind of a pain but I think what's so interesting now that anyone who's teaching has 100% seen this in your classes, 
There's tool now that use natural language that help us solve a number of problems. Those are things like large language models. And so we have been, so, okay, good, this worked. We have been um, using large language models, and this is really the work of Alex Gagliano and Kaylee DeSoto, though, um, to build chatbots that help us make these sort of data queries without having to resort to the SQL statements, the SQL queries. We can ask questions like, um, tell me the names and coordinates of all the type two supernovae that we've observed in the last, what is it, 60 days. He's gonna think for a long time. We're trying to upgrade our GPU. <laughs> um, and this chatbot who is lovingly named the Speak Yeezy, based on our survey, can tell us that and we can ask follow-up questions. You know, I think that this sort of retrieval from databases is interesting, it's kind of cute, but there might be something here. It would be interesting to know. Can I ask a higher level question? Can I ask, show me supernovae with two bumps? I, I didn't write any filter to do that, I'm just asking. Show me, I found this weird supernova. Show me all of the ones that look kind of close to this weirdo. That might be something that we're able to eventually get to in the future, in the survey of the future, but it's maybe a few years away. Uh -oh. Well, I think that is it anyways. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna leave it at that and just say thank you so much again for listening and I think I have maybe one or two minutes to take a few questions, so thanks. Ashley, great talk. Um, so most of the data you've been showing, you have like thousands of days of data or thousands of galaxies, so very huge data sets. I'm kind of wondering, what's the other extreme? What is like the smallest you could get and still think that it's like a reasonable result and you're not, yeah, in your data set? Like how many points do you need or something to make it an actual thing versus an artificial thing? Yeah, it's really hard to answer that question. I can explain why. If I have two points here and here, and I want to make a machine learning model to interpolate, a line does a, probably a pretty good job if your data follows that line. If your data secretly follows a squiggle, you've done a terrible job. So what I'm saying in words is that the uh, complexity of your data is hard to quantify, and you need a lot of points to understand that. So it's hard for me to answer without knowing the complexity of the system. But it could be a really small number, yeah. Question? There's no sign of anybody batting the door now, so. We have an Ashley line. You have. Sorry. Hey. Nice talk. Um, so the speakeasy is very cool looking, and you know I think we're going to see a lot more of that. To me, it sort of raises the obvious question of uh, what if the answer it gives you is wrong? Uh, oh. So what what do you uh, how do you plan to handle that? Yeah, you should talk to Alex about this. Um, so this is actually a really fun, we should talk about it actually, is a really fun case in which if you hallucinate, if you get something wrong, the SQL query fails. It's like, it's a great test of lying to you. Um, there are ways, interestingly, to constrain answer space so that it has to follow a rule set. That's one way that we're going. Um, another way is to understand when it should just call a deterministic function. Um, this gets a lot harder when we start asking natural language questions, and I don't have a great answer for that. But in this case, it's so structured that we can check our answer. Yeah. Well, Ashley, as you know, I'm sure there are more questions, but here's the good news. This speaker lives very close to this room. <laughs> so let's just thank Ashley again, and we're sorry we have to run off.